You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Reddy, and we are in the little blue shed in the depths of Bedfordshire in England. And we've got a mailbag show for you today. I hope you enjoyed our summer content. We had two of our new magazine style shows, and I get the feeling from people that that's working. Like we're getting positive feedback. It means we can have a variety of guests and we can record them at a time where each individual guest is is free. We don't have to bully people onto an 8 p.m. stream on a on a Sunday. It does offer us a lot of creative freedom as well. And a lot of the crew are seeing that and wanting to get involved now and saying, right, can I do a segment? Can I do an interview? And I hope that we're going to get more content that isn't produced by me. Like the Tech Time crew did an amazing job without me while I was off. Uh, Steve... Summers and Matt Trumpets created Tech Time, and I said to you that I would be checking the downloads, and it does look like a bunch of you have been eating your vegetables. So that's great. It was a great episode for downloads. We had really good feedback, uh, so um, I, I hope you enjoyed that, and we'll do more of those. And I would like this stream to become more than just a vehicle for me to jump online and be a turnip. We do want to build squad depth. We have a lot of presenters. Uh, interviewers and content producers in the map stable so i want to start actually before we get into the mailbag with a thank you so do feel free to skip forward a couple of minutes i have a specific reason for this but i do want to thank as i often do our patreon supporters who donate a small amount of money every month in re- in, re- in return they get a- a- some nominal things an ad free feed a chance to join our-, our patreon slack group and a little bit of extra content but mostly they are supporting an independent content creator. I would also like to thank anyone who's donated to our tip jar or ever shared a link because you guys have empowered me over the past, oh, I would say five, six months since since F1 has really taken a spike up. I would say that this year alone, I have had five genuine meetings with outfits that have wanted to work with Missed Apex Podcast or bring Missed Apex Podcast into their fold. And all of those from big tv networks that you'll definitely have heard of all the way down to you know podcast networks that do well a little bit more low-key they all offer genuine opportunities for revenue and growth but all of them to one extent or the other wanted some control some sort of control and that's understandable because it's their empire and they're trying to bring you into it and control is huge for an independent content creator like me the risk of giving up control is the risk of losing missed apex or losing what missed apex is and it would be like losing one of my lesser favored children or 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 a pet or something and ultimately i stood strong on those elements of control and i was able to do that because patreon support has always been the core of what missed apex is and makes us able to pay for itself pay for its time for its equipment uh, to build for the future and to go out and like book events look we've got some money can we book this place, this cart track, please? So Patreon gave me the strength to stand firm when I was asked to budge on control issues. And it turns out that that put every negotiation to bed, ultimately, that ended all of those very lovely chats. And was that the right decision? I don't know. Maybe in the end we get swamped by all the big boys and I should have jumped on a turtle's back at some point. But because of the support we have and because of the amount of patrons we have and the amount of listeners we have, I I do feel like it's okay for me to live or die on this hill. And I'm not against that sort of deal. Like I will, I I could be tempted in the future. I'm sure my soul has a price. After all, I did once sell it for a shiny queen's shilling. And money's great because money can be exchanged for rum. But whatever happens, any partnership for Missed Apex podcast would have to be just that, a partnership. So to our supporters... Thank you for helping us keep our independence. We already have the best partner, which is you guys. And and though these conversations were genuine and well-intentioned, I always had this nagging feeling that they were asking me to sell something that wasn't quite mine to sell. So we are still an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed with the kind support of our partners. We aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. We're joined today by someone who gives me no support at all, Matt Two Rumpets. Hey, Matt. 
Spa, all the seasons, none of the laps. Oh, I've heard there's a new policy for Spa. If it rains even a tiny bit, they're just going to go home and give Max double points. I, I, that would not surprise me at all. <laughs> We're also joined by someone who I would say actively detracts from my own mental health and the project, Chris Stevens. Hey, Chris. Hey, Spanners. You know, it's weird being back doing the live streams. We've had a few weeks off during the summer break. And you know what? I'm, I'm ready to be back. I'm ready to see some Formula One cars in action again. Triple header, Chris. Triple header. Oh, God. Is it really? Oh, no, yeah. I'm not that ready yet. <laughs> I'm not emotionally prepared for this much racing. And from the Netherlands, we've got Jules Sagers joining us. Hey, Jules. Good evening, Spanners. I'm uh, glad to be on because I was starting to feel a bit lonely in here because almost half of us are still on summer holiday, somewhere <laughs> in Southern Europe. And the other half probably off storming uh, the spa circuit mm. to invade as the Orange Army does. Are you not going to be joining the swathes of Orange? Nah, I'm, I'm stuck in, in the middle. I returned from summer holiday already, and I'm not going to spa to join the Orange Army. Uh, but in the Netherlands, you all get issued a flare in case you want to go to the... I have to say, Jules, as a, a Dutch man, those flares are a nightmare. I hate them. It's pointless. You can't see the cars. Imagine being at a track and people having those flares in front of you. Yeah, so maybe uh, that illustrates how some of the i well, i i always get get abused when i say this but how some of the uh, orange army uh, fans aren't really there to watch a race but just they're there, to, there to kind of it's almost like a festival but is, is other yeah. dutch sports like that i know football maybe that has that reputation well, uh, and we're the same here as well yeah but football stadiums they don't allow uh flares ah, and, uh, okay. and smoke bombs so they all go to the f1 fans it, it does feel like that is something we need to to get rid of in F1, we, you know, because we get to control stuff. Any fans of flares, Chris, adding to the carnival atmosphere? No. I think they look great on TV and they do add to the atmosphere, but there are many, many negatives to them as well, like the ones you've just listed out. And I, I can't believe at some point no driver has brought this up as a sort of visibility issue as yeah, well. Yeah, maybe it does disperse by the time it gets to the, to the driver's mat. Yeah. Yeah, well, I suspect they're still more worried about the brake dust and so forth. But I, I am looking forward to the first uh, wildfire, flare-induced wildfire safety car <laughs> at some of the drier circuits. Yeah, I suppose. Oh, what you mean like they're just going around for their formation lap, the, the flares come up, and then they go, well, we can't see, so drop a safety car. Or, or say, exactly. they might even just say, do another formation lap, I suppose, would be the easiest. We, yes. we do have bushfires already over here because of uh, the drought. Mm. And uh, so maybe, who knows, in Spa it will happen again. But I think a forecast said rain, right? Well, yeah. Don't worry. We we and most of Northern Europe have as well the, the bushfires at the moment. So you're not yeah. alone in that. Oh, apparently flares have been banned at Spa, we've been told. So that was a complete waste of time, that oh, conversation. Really? Oh, what a wasted so, segment. So instead... But the TV cameras, they love the flares. So instead, let's get on to the listener mailbag. I'm going to take a pull at the listener mailbag first. Actually, there's three people who all asked very similar questions. So Oliver starts with, um, hey, great show. That helps. I'll definitely, I'll pick your question. I'll be more likely, we adore praise. So more likely to pick questions with praise. Like many others, I got into F1 with Drive to Survive. My addiction is now out of control. It got so bad, I became a patron of a podcast made by some dude in a shed. Anyway, it seems like you guys are enriching your viewing experience with live data, Twitter, and a few other data sources uh, on top of that, on top of the F1 stream. What additions to the F1 stream do you suggest to take the viewing to a new high? That's from Oliver. Thank you. Great email. Similar one from, from Chris saying, what is your setup for the race weekend? What's on your second or maybe third screen? Glad you included that one, Chris. And uh, does it change based on how the race unfolds? And then we also had an email as well from Carl who said, my question is, what is the optimal setup for watching F1? Now, this is interesting because, you know, years and years ago, there was only the TV to turn on and you watch the stream. Over the years, that has evolved, evolved for me. The, the Hearing what other people are saying and thinking about Formula One has become almost as important to me <laughs> as the experience of, of watching the race as well. And on the occasions of, say, an early Grand Prix in Australia, where I've like woken up and gone, oh, I'll just watch it on my phone for a bit, 
it's been no good because the phone is is where I tweet and talk to the Slack group and speak to the guys on the WhatsApp group. So I found that I need to have a definitely a dedicated screen for uh, for the for the Grand Prix to free up the phone. So that's been like one example where second screening and third screening has become vitally important to me. But for example, if I am running late, so I used to work on Sunday mornings, if I'm I'm running late and I'm only going to just get there in time, I have to call ahead and get my boy Treeface to say, do the setup, get our, our setup, I'm going to be home, I'll be home just in time, don't worry about it. And he will, he'll get a laptop up on a little table between the two of us that has the live timing on one side and has our patron Slack group on the other side. And then I'll have another tab for Twitter and I'll have another tab for WhatsApp. And then I will do my show notes before the race review on my phone. So I am at least one, two, I'm three screening with the laptop split into two parts and at least three or four tabs open. Uh, Jules, a lot of nods there. Are you? Can you compete with my screen real estate? Yeah, I can relate to how through the years this uh, this set of expense. <laughs> um, I read I read the question and um, um, I was thinking like um, you know the, the Twitter the the live timing. Some uh, some people use the 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 tracker when you see all the dots on the on the track layout where everyone is. And I thought like. Um, you know, when I when I started to get into F1, how how did I immerse myself into it? And yeah. I and I thought maybe uh, part of an answer uh, to this question is like, uh, what can you do on beforehand to um, to uh, enrich uh, yes. Yes. the the moment when the race is actually on? And now I started thinking like, well, maybe what I do is uh, listen to uh, a podcast to preview. Uh, the weekend or who uh, preview the race after qualifying uh, so you often get a sense of what uh, what might happen What's tactically yeah. what going to be strategy um also uh what i still like to do is watch all the races uh, on the track that's coming up you know so like this week i was i was strolling no. through 90s uh, spa races do you or, really uh, <laughs> yeah yeah so because yeah. when you when you get a sense of the sports history or a track's history um really you, you appreciate it more and i think one one uh, aspect one way to to immerse yourself even more uh, I think we already had this mentioned on, on one of the shows last year. It's like uh, play an F1 game and it doesn't even have to be like a, a real sim uh, or whatever. Just yes, yeah. play, play, play the, the, the F1 game on your console or whatever. Because once you uh, dr drive the track yourself and you start to appreciate certain corners or why overtaking is so difficult, hmm. uh, you start to appreciate uh, overtakes at, at spots where it's almost impossible. Or, or, you know, it's like with everything, when you do it yourself in, in, a, in a more or lesser extent, mm. you appreciate what's happening on the screen. Even things like the effect of slipstream and you go oh my gosh it's so important if i lose the pack with slipstream yeah. here I, i'm completely lost but yes so definitely i will try and get my boy to if we get a chance to go on the sim and jump on say like you know silverstone in a in an f3 car so he can understand the layout i think knowing the layout and what corners are coming up is really important for understanding the race there's certain tracks where i get completely lost as to where they are on the track and it ruins my enjoyment sochi i never know where yeah. what part of the track the camera is yeah. pointing to elements of Baku, Paul Ricard as well. So yeah. there's no like visual marker. So yeah. you, you're right. So we we're talking about um, uh, you know watching during the race, but really we're about to set ourselves homework, Jules. <laughs> yeah, because, and, and, and I'm starting to come off like some some kind of real F1 nerd now. But... Yeah, you're sounding like a psycho, but that's great. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> it's like the grandpa tells a story, but you know, I I uh, subscribe myself to a, a magazine like on paper. Um, what? <laughs> it's almost like Uncle Joe uh, type stuff. Jules, do you no, go I, to do you go to a shop to go and buy your magazine? As a kid, I uh, I did that. Mm -hmm. I rode my bike to the next town because <laughs> it sold uh, it sold Formula One magazines. Anyway, uh, I subscribe subscribe myself a couple of years back to a magazine that that specifies in in um, 
how do you say the vintage F1 stories. Nice. So they always go back in time. Like this, this time they focus on a certain chassis or like an iconic car or uh, an iconic battle or an iconic Formula One drive or whatever. And it's just you know you 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 you're you're uh, pulled into uh, these stories that happen way way before even when when you weren't born sometimes. I, but I, yeah. It just makes you appreciate the sport, you know. I, I struggle watching past races because I know, like, unless it's like a happy ending for all my drivers, like if it's a painful race, I don't think I'll re- want to rewatch it. Like I don't want to rewatch last year's Spa where it got, <laughs> where it got no, you, do, you, you, you watch races that mm. you either forgot or you never even saw before. But ev- yeah. even further back in time, you're right yeah. there. And I think like get out of the current generation of drivers as well. So you're, you're sort of less yeah. invested in the moment. Uh, but, for example, when we're talking about our in-race setup, you know, not the homework that Jules is setting us, Spa is quite a good example. So although Spa didn't kick off and d- nothing happened, and there was like no racing, we spent that time as a community kind of hanging out. So whether it's in your Twitter echo chamber and you all go and, uh, and, and pile on some Latifi fans, no, don't do that, don't do pylons, or whether you're in a Slack group or a WhatsApp group, we still enjoyed and kind of hung out in all that time a little bit, which takes, which took a little bit of the pain and the sting off it. I don't, can't even remember if we did a race review. I think we ended up just doing a quality review, basically. But one of the bits of homework you're talking about, I, I turn to Matt if I'm unable to watch all the Friday practice sessions. Because although you can't tell ultimate pace on Friday, you can tell, say, if one team seems to be running better comparatively on hot lap pace than they normally do or has better race pace. And I, I like to sit and watch the lap times for the long run races. Even if I do, even if I don't, I still refer to you because you always seem to have a good handle on how that's going to translate to the race. Yeah, I like to watch the practices. I don't watch the first practice too, I don't know, carefully. I put it on usually with breakfast. Yeah, it's a shakedown. S- Second practice, I'll pay a little more attention, but I probably will just watch it on one screen, just the video with the F1 TV commentary, because I like their commentary a little bit better these days for the practices. And then I start to get serious around a free practice three. And so by the time you get into quality, then I've got full involvement. So, so my setup is I have my main screen is 39 and a half inch uh, curved screen where I have two windows or three, three windows for quality, two windows for the race. One of them is the video. The other one would be the tracker. And the third one would be the micro sectors well, for what's quality. The, well, what's this tracker? Like, I don't get this tracker in the UK. It, it comes with F1 TV, and it just shows the location of we the get cars it. on the track. I don't think we get um, that. I don't think we get that in the UK. That sounds really good, especially when it comes to things like pit stop windows and like just and building the picture of the race. Well, it's really, actually, I find it to be super important in qualifying because you can see where traffic is going to happen ahead of time. You can see the order people go out in. So, you know, when laps Mm. are completed and who's who's still on a lap and who's not still on a lap. And then I have on my iPad, I have the timing app with uh, five live and all the sector times Mm. and, and best lap times. And between all of that, I can that's that's my F1 information. Then I have Slack and WhatsApp up as well. And of course, my friend Twitter. <laughs> oh, one of my favorite things there is the live timing. And I get asked quite a lot, like, what are you getting out of the live timing? I think it is essential for, for tracking the strategy of a race. So you can see, you can start to actually tell when people are tire saving a little bit as well. And that it's much more obvious when you're watching the live timings. But when there's a chase on and, you know, someone's done that, oh, I'm going to do a 15 lap dash on soft tires to see if I can, you know, that extra pit stop can can make up positions. And then you start to see, oh, the lap times start to disappear. You know, one's not quite, oh, that's going like yellow, yellow or whatever. And then you go, oh, there's a pattern here. You can start to see the tire wear. And and then you have to add context to it. Like, oh, is this a situation where he would definitely be wanting to push? Is this a a situation where they'd be tire saving, say more in the in the first part of the race and it can give you an idea of the strategy and i think without the live timing it can you can lose track of that jules also if you start wondering stuff like that uh due to what you see on live timing 
it could also be re rewarding to start listening to team radio of a certain driver. Of course, it's not uh, available to everyone. Uh, I think in most countries you need to pay for it, but you can select team radio per driver. And if you think like, oh, what's happening to Esteban yeah, Ocon? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's gaining on Alonso. What's the team going to tell him about passing Alonso or not? You just tune in and you listen. And that's it, it's really enriches your, uh, your experience. So I don't, I've got to add an extra screen to my setup. I forgot about this. So I don't know if um, the, F1, the F1 live feed that you get from the website gives you all the radio calls or they pick select ones i think they pick select ones on those ones and i've got my 12 year old on his mobile with an earbud so he's got one earbud and he tells me if there was anything if there was anything significant about that uh, but i didn't know that you could like pick and go right oh i must now monitor alpine yeah last year at least f1 tv you could just pick every driver and i i used to be like one earpiece with team radio and the other ear listening to the tv commentary <laughs> live time but whatever we, we discussed this already yeah i i do wish they had a separate audio channel that was nothing but team radio because i would i would i would have that as my third audio okay, feed so just to hear all the messages oh all of them not a select bunch just like have all of them yeah Mm. But a lot yeah. of the a lot of the skills you need as a viewer, Chris, is the skills you need as a commentator, and a lot of it is building up a picture of a race. When you're doing karting commentary, you can see the whole track, so that's kind of like having a, a live track mapper, isn't it? Uh, but with F1, of course, it's it's more difficult, and with live oh, with Formula E that you were commentating on, yeah. yeah, it's a bit different. I forgot forgot what a big deal you are now, Chris. Thanks for coming, <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. I mean, I didn't have a track map or uh, anything <laughs> like that when I was doing the just Formula E, just a live timing and a world feed. But uh, the thing, I've been very quiet during this segment because I just put Sky F1 on and watch <laughs> that. I don't have any extra screen. I look, maybe I'll tweet every once in a while, but like all these things that you're saying, it helps you do that. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't really need that. It doesn't. <laughs> So Doesn't hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, Chris. You're saying that the F1 starts, you put the TV onto the F1 channel, and yeah. then and then you just sit there and enjoy the experience like a psychopath. Yeah, yeah, I just sit there and I enjoy, <laughs> enjoy the broadcast. Screens? Oh, my goodness. The, no. the only thing I would like from everything you've just listed there is the, the full team radio stuff. But even then, I think I would get annoyed because you can only listen to one at a time. They were like, oh, but what if I miss something on the other car? Like, ah, oh, God, I got to pick which one is the luck of the draw. Which oh, one are you going to Okay, well, have? we're lucky because we've got the Patreon Slack community. So we can maybe we can assign one person to each team radio <laughs> and do a transcript of anything. <gasps> Should we set that up? Should we set that up, Patreon Slack group? Should we do that? All right, great. Well, I think um, hopefully that did answer the questions there from Carl, Chris and Oliver. It's definitely become more intense over the years, my F1 viewing experience. The, yeah, the times I have had to revert to, like I'm not home and I've had to just have one screen on my phone. It's It's been killing me because I've been like, oh, but I'm missing out on all the, the conversation. Or if I have to watch it after the race, if I've been working and I have to watch it back on a replay, I will still enjoy it. I will do the Chris method of turning the channel on and pressing play, but it is a totally, totally different experience. And by the time we get to the race review, I do find that my my colleagues on the panel have a much richer view of the race and what just happened. But uh, yeah, great great question, and do let us know. You know, if you do anything different to us, we love your feedback, and we're uh, now actually addressing it properly. Feedback at mistapex.net drops into my inbox and into Matt's inbox as well. Let's move on to some more of your questions. <laughs> All right, Matt, go for it. What you got? What you found? Oh, I have so many to choose from, but I'll talk about everybody's favorite team to berate for strategy mistakes, and that's Ferrari. Our friend Brendan <laughs> has written in with a theory <laughs> that Ferrari are still on their 2019 engine shenanigans timeout, and they've just had to get way more clever about how they lose because they've actually built a good car this season. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, Matt, we need a bit of a primer for anyone who's, who's joined F1 recently and to refresh our memories. What is this alleged Ferrari 2019 timeout? Thank you for using the correct word. It was alleged, but never proven or shown, at least openly in public, that Ferrari figured out a way to... Um, put more fuel into their power unit than was allowed by the regulations 
but because the regulations measure fuel with a particular piece of technology that did not catch them doing it, technically they might not have been cheating in the same way Sebastian Vettel and others have occasionally started their race before everyone else, but not enough before that it was considered a jump start. Okay. However, However, the FIA was pretty convinced something was up and there was some negotiating and suddenly Ferrari was a lot slower than they were the previous year. So. Well, not even that. It happened mid-season, didn't it? I remember them dropping off towards the end of the season. Well, they, they did. It was like sort of the thing like, oh, you've noticed it, so we'll turn it down. But mm. it was too late. It had been noticed. And then the following season was, well, epically disastrous, yeah. catastrophic, you might say. They've come back from that, but but that brings us to now, where Ferrari have potentially a winning car. Sorry, Matt, I just think for legal purposes, we do need to absolutely clarify. We're, we're talking about an alleged uh, punishment, yep. secret punishment, and an alleged uh, infraction. circumventing. Yes. Yeah, infraction. So just There's... to be com completely clear, I think they definitely did it, and there was definitely a secret punishment. They definitely allegedly did it, yes. <laughs> but at the time it was and this, this is what gets me going chris is because like a lot of at the time if you remember people were going oh no you'd have to be mad to think it's, it's a crazy conspiracy and it doesn't seem like a crazy conspiracy at all and now like when you have the flexi floors i'm like yeah anything's possible anything like this can definitely happen in f1 yeah i mean often there's no uh no smoke without flames right so there's, uh, or is it the other way around? No flame without smoke? No, you got it two. right the first time. Oh, thank God. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, there's often a way with these things. Yeah. If, if somebody's pointing at something, it's okay. something but what would you prefer? Thing. What would you prefer? Because it does seem to always be secret e secret -y. Oh, we found a thing. Okay, well done. You know, we, you got away with it. But they, the FI seem reluctant to like, you know, drag someone over the coals publicly. And there's always been rumors, even like some of the crazier ones, like McLaren weren't allowed to win the 2007 World Championship. But, you know, yeah. yeah but so there, there seems a reluctance. Like there must be loads of cheating going on. But the mm -hmm. FI have never like gone, you know, uh, Christian Horner must walk through Spa with bells behind him. Shame, shame, <laughs> flexi floor, shame. It wouldn't be a great look for the sport if every single account of cheating was brought mm. into the public eye because it probably happens uh, far more than we uh, than we think of. Or let's not necessarily call it cheating. Let's call it loopholing. <laughs> and Matt, that uh, brings us to today. <laughs> that brings us to today, where, where I'm going to sadly have to put the kibosh on the tinfoil hat theory that Ferrari are still losing on purpose and say that yeah, based on a, an off-air discussion I've had with various technical people, if I had to put my finger on Ferrari's biggest problem, I mean, you could say strategy, you could say, well, they're Ferrari, um, or you could say what the real problem is, is their tire modeling is just wrong. Made it about tires, everyone drink. Well, how are you and, making this about tires? Uh, well, bec I will tell you why, because if yeah, I every you single ferrari strategy error has been tire based either they think the tires won't last as long or they think they need to get off them too soon or they think they'll even work like the hard tire and and hungry they have just been really really wrong about the tires every time that's been an important part of the strategy and it's cost them i think by far more than you know even driver error has cost them yeah, yeah, it definitely, I think, what's the phrase, Matt? You know, never assigned to malice what can be easily assigned to getting it wrong. Yeah. I don't want to say incompetence. I didn't want to say that. I think the Ferrari strategists have had a, a lot of stick. But, mate, you, are, you, are you sort of slightly excusing it by saying because their tile mo modelling isn't right, maybe that's making it harder for the strategists to make these calls? Yeah, absolutely. If you've got your tire model wrong, everything from pit windows to how long your stents are going to be are going to be equally off. If I think I can go onto the hard tire in Hungary, then a two then a one stop strategy is a winning strategy. But then when I put my lead driver on it and they lose thirteen seconds over ten laps to someone still on the medium tires running a running a whole extra pit stop, then that one stop strategy is no longer a good idea. Everybody else understood once the first teams went onto the hard tires they weren't going to work but ferrari didn't which suggests to me they have a model and they're too focused on that and not paying attention to other stuff around them all right fascinating stuff made it about tires all right good
good. You're let's welcome. Move, let's move on. Maybe maybe a non-tie related topic will, will come up. <laughs> As I press the button, which has a graphic for the YouTube viewers, you will see that it is all tires flying across the screen as if to mock me. OK, so, oh, by the way, if you're an audio listener, if you just download on the pod, every now and then check out what we do on the video because there's some great work here by by Uncle Steve and um, and me pressing the right buttons at the right times. And um, we feel like the YouTube is an integral part of what we do here at Missed Apex Podcast. So every now and then, if you want to drop in on a live stream or just see our faces, have have a look. See, guess who you think is the handsomest out of this panel now and then, uh, you know, then look in at Chris and realise that you're wrong. I mean, I was just going to say, I mean, we're all really good looking uh, people, so we can only enrich yeah. your podcasting experience. Also, if you're, a, if you're a video person, just down subscribe on the audio and download it in case you need it. Then it's there. It's there if you need it. At least you'll have it. Just auto-download. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. You'll have it. It'll be there. Yeah, and it pays more money than YouTube, so... Oh, we, we, we need to do... Um, it does, yes. <laughs> we need to do... Sorry, before the next question. Very quickly, if you are an iRacer, if you're a sim racer, you can come and join us on the next round of our uh, six-race... Our six-round uh, tournament monthly starts... When is it, Chris? September 17th? uh yes i think okay. so yes yeah, september 17th i think so yeah. there's a lot of new things happening uh this season and uh, i mean chief among which we've set out all the dates and all the tracks yes you're gonna have all that information you can bookmark it in your calendar adjust anything you need in your schedule uh as well to get all six rounds in it's good live commentary from chris stevens you'll be able to watch it all back on a great live production so you have three races where one has an enforced pit stop using the f3 car and also at the end of the evening there's one oval race which will make up a, a six round oval race as well email race control at mistapex.net and we'll make sure when the link is ready for you to sign up the it will be sent to you as well race control at mistapex.net now jules you have a mailbag question for us yes yes uh, we uh, we have um i believe it's about regulations jules yeah there was a question i'm trying to look for i, I always think it's kind to i ah, hear it is it's from brandon ah. not brandon but brandon, brandon with, a, with yep. double e and he said i have a theory um no oh, no sorry i'm i'm making to be fair to, we have had two people called brandon spelt differently send us emails and uh, and i present them with a wall of text uh, when I, I go right here's all the feedback we've got guys uh pick out the one that you want to address yeah all the, although to make it a bit more embarrassing for me this wasn't from brandon or brandon it, it was just john oh i would have I mean, just pretended. how could i forget no it, it was john. Come on, then. He, he said um um he said um that he loved the show, of course, oh, and uh, like like many questions that was that was sent in for this for the show, he says that he uh, got into um, into Formula yeah. due to drive to survive. Yeah, you don't have um, to apologize. Everyone seems to say it in an apologetic way. It's okay. Welcome. Yeah. We're really really glad you're here. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, and he, he said, uh, due to the, the new technical regulations uh, for this season that would, uh, you know, make, make uh, cars following each other, uh, would improve that. And he asked, like, um, why it took so long uh, or hasn't, why hasn't this been the goal uh, of, of the regulations to make following easier? um in the past why just only just now and um well john uh, there's a there's a, a famous quote from enzo ferrari um <laughs> and i knew it was ferrari's I'm, fault yeah I'm, I, <laughs> I'm taking a liberty to to quote him probably not uh, not very accurately but he said like aerodynamics are for people who can build engines <laughs> in, and, in, um, in england we have the phrase well we use the word paraphrasing a lot which means i've probably got the quote wrong but yes he did basically said you know dismissed the whole aerodynamic industry yeah, yeah yeah and and that indicates the the time uh the era uh where uh, ferrari and enzo ferrari were you know dominating the sport it was just about engine power and it was motor racing in maybe its purest purest form because it was about the the motor the engine and uh the faster it went uh, uh would mean you you'd win and only in the late 60s 
uh, aerodynamics uh, became became a thing and um, uh, the team started to uh, to develop uh, knowledge of what aerodynamics were how it would help them and the word downforce uh, was uh, was introduced even till the late 70s uh, it, it lasted before um, uh, and i think i believe but correct me if i'm wrong someone uh, I believe it was uh, Lotus, the team Team Lotus, that um, uh, started to uh, exploit downforce uh, in a proper way, uh, using uh, the wings, using aerodynamic bits uh, on the bodywork to uh, gain time not only by engine power or engines or uh, tires, excuse me, but also due to downforce. So, um, if you look at uh, Formula One as a sport and how long it exists. Uh, the the knowledge of of aerodynamics and uh, how to how to, uh, to how to treat it, it's it's fairly young. And then when that happened, uh, even then uh, teams were were free to do whatever they wanted. So even up until the nineties, uh, that's why you look back at at all the races, guys. <laughs> so you, then you see like cars yes. were, were had all these kind of different shapes and shapes and sizes noses uh, uh wings uh, the bodywork yeah uh, you could recognize cars just by the shape of them and even if you look at say even like a williams around the early days of the malaysian grand prix coming out of a hairpin and you just see how much more they're struggling because they're so much more they're so less planted but i think the problem is once they have opened this toolbox it there was no going back chris that's the problem so once you open the box it was always going to be a drive towards more and more aerodynamics Exactly, and when when teams started all to to gain knowledge and to to uh, to understand the, the the aerodynamic the downforce game, uh, then at a certain point it wasn't just about optimizing your own aerodynamics; it was also started to become about <laughs> spoiling other others aerodynamics. You know, like and then with the the whole dirty air discussion, the wake discussion. Uh, you know the team's aerodynamics yeah. and designers. They weren't only busy trying to 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 design the best car. They were also busy trying to spoil other ones races. You know. Yeah, and that's why. That's... Yeah, I grew up in an era of F1 where overtaking was sort of impossible, Chris. And you know the famous Murray Walker commentary quote was, "Well, you catching in F1 is one thing, but passing is quite another." And it was almost an impossible feat. Yeah, I think the. 2022 changes uh, mark a sort of paradigm shift in what Formula One is prioritizing. Formula One is three things. It is business, it is sport, and it is entertainment. Oh, entertainment. Okay. And I think all other regulation changes in the past either come in because the cars are getting too fast and they reduce the amount of downforce they have for safety reasons or ban certain things that they think are too expensive or are going to make one team too competitive and uh it ruined the sport a little bit but this is the first time that they made a conscious decision to improve the show and that's never really mattered before to formula one because it's always been about what what is it as a as a sport yeah and in in, in doing so it hasn't taken anything away from that but i think it was also the rising voices of the fans saying there's no overtaking there's no overtaking races are boring we want more overtaking and all this suddenly somewhere around 2015 16 17 overtaking became all anyone gave a damn about Ooh, i'm gonna put that in a bit more historical context in a second but uh matt yeah well i i would like to just amend that to say this is the first time the sport has taken it seriously and followed through with the full recommendations mm. because back in 2010 there was indeed yeah. an overtaking working group which i think spanners might have been about to reference himself oh, okay. and uh, yeah not actually i was about to be a little bit more forward in time but yes you're right and and weren't um the groove tires weren't wasn't that a part of an effort to make overtaking easier to make it to give you less grip basically make make it less on rails i think they just had too much grip in yeah, yeah. So, like so, 97. Take, yeah. so just taking away some of the grip i get it Right. Um, so they put forward recommendations, but the sport did not implement all of them, I think, possibly because some people were concerned that the cars wouldn't look great on TV. So the actual aim of those regulations was never fully seen. We don't mm. know if they would have worked because they weren't fully implemented. This time, however, 
they 100% implemented after a fair amount of testing, including uh, supposedly, allegedly, I have heard, multiple cars in the wind tunnel <laughs> at the same time to see exactly what's Ooh, going on. Did they? Yes. That's good. Okay, well, I, I was actually going to fast forward to 2014 to answer the second part of John's question was, uh, has this always been the goal of the regulations in the past or are they just more successful at it this time? So actually in 2014, there was a big panic if you'll remember, because the cars were slow. It was the beginning of the hybrid era and people were panicking that the lap times actually were starting to look a little bit more like Formula 2. Or was it was it F2 at the time? Still GP2. Still, G, still GP2. Thing. But GP2 didn't have the hybrid engines. So it wasn't having the same trade-offs that F1 was having. Yeah, so the decrease in downforce, mainly from banning all the stuff they were doing with exhaust gases to add mm. rear downforce, narrowing the wings and all this kind of stuff, basically meant that in, in some of the higher downforce circuits like Barcelona, where they were really missing that downforce, the top cars in GP2 mm -hmm. were faster than the slowest cars in Formula 1, yeah. like the the, the Mauritius and the uh, the Caterhams. And this led to a big outcry from, from F1 fans, actually. It did come from the F1 fan base first, where people saying, you know, this is embarrassing, this is horrendous, this is, this is meant to be the pinnacle of Formula 1. We cannot have the, the lap times being slow. Now, I've, I've, it's never occurred to me to care specifically what the stopwatch says on an f1 car to me like chris said there's lots of different types of fans to me the the racing action has always been important the engineering is a, a sideline to me I, I like the tech i'm interested in it i like the teams competing against each other but f1 being 10 seconds faster than it was 10 years ago is not important to me it doesn't need to progress it doesn't need to go around spa francochamp any quicker than it does now for me to be a sport. But the huge reaction was, this is outrageous. F1 needs to be faster. So that next regulation change actually was focused on making the cars faster, making the downforce more. And by the time the regulation change came in, the cars had sort of sorted themselves out. So the problem sort of went away as teams got used to the hybrid era. And then they brought in a regulation set where, where you couldn't pass, you couldn't race. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily the um, adding the downforce back. I think Pirelli made the most gains, actually, from 2014 to 2016. But this is what everyone said, because Formula One made a snap decision when they came under criticism for having slow cars. They're like, right, we're going to make them five seconds the faster cars than ever. Yeah. And everyone said, well, then they won't race each other. And that's exactly what happened. So suddenly they had to do a U-turn and make them <laughs> able to race each other um, again, even though... The 2017 through 21 era represented a much, much better time to be a Formula One fan than 14 through 16, for example. For yeah. me, they're the worst years of Formula One I've watched. But we could have got a head, we, we could have got a head start on, on this philosophy, which is the one that John is talking about. This philosophy to improve following is seems to be working, but it has to come from the top. The FYA has to go being able to follow is a priority. And I think this is the first time that this specific goal, being able to follow, has, has A, been really pushed for from the top and has worked. And, and surely, Matt, there's more to come. This is only the first season of it. I'm really hopeful that they'll, if they keep down the path and keep the will to do it, there's no reason why they can't carry on. And, and let's understand, it's also the FOM because they're the ones who funded the research, getting all of the getting all of the wheels pointed in the same direction. You had Pirelli developing tires that would allow for this kind of following. You had the aerodynamics that would get rid of the outwash mm -hmm. that made it so very, very hard for the teams to follow. You have all these pieces coming together, but let's not kid ourselves. This is a constant evolutionary war between the teams who want to do what they want to do, and the FIA slash FOM who want to pin them back and keep them from ruining <laughs> what's already started to work. And I will just point out that Aston rear wing that looks like a traditional rear wing is the opening salvo mm -hmm. of what the teams are going to be up to in terms of reclaiming lap time and downforce yeah. from this current regulation set. Right. So 
I have a question that relates to what Jules was saying near the beginning of that segment, which is once you start finding that aerodynamics, it's hard to let it go. And even though you were saying it was recent, it was actually, what that's the 60s, isn't it, Jules? That's actually quite a long time ago. I know you're significantly older than me, but like most F1 fans now know Formula One as an aerodynamic sport. And now that I do have, you know, a higher caliber of random person in my dms these days if anyone on the inside of f1 wants to tell me if this long-standing suspicion i have is correct is that socially politically within f1 you have to keep the aerodynamics departments because teams have built themselves around this core of aerodynamicists a lot of the team bosses will be aerodynamicists and will will have this you know deep understanding at the senior level of aerodynamics and feel that aerodynamics is part of f1 I've heard lots of people saying, well, why don't we just rip the wings off of F1 cars? If you, if you really want to get rid of the aero, just rip the wings off. We'll still have great racing or, or just make them like a flat plank for show, like in Formula E. But I've got a feeling that politically you couldn't put however many is, is a thousand aerodynamicists out of work. Like philosophically, Jules, I just feel like it's so ingrained into F1 that you've, you, can't, you can't let it go. Yeah, de definitely. Uh, I mean, the... A part of Formula One is the looks, isn't it? And so a part of the fan base who remembers the, the 2008, 2007 cars that looked like spaceships with all kinds of flaps and little wings <laughs> and nostrils, whatever. Um, it, it's part of the part of the game, and and we shouldn't drop it. Um, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to keep uh, the listeners uh, telling them to watch all the races, but. <laughs> Uh, in in the early 80s, even they, the cars didn't even have wings. They just had noses and 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 a rear wing, but the front wing wasn't even there. So um, uh, it's 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 part of the of the Formula One is not only uh, about going fast or whatever. It's also about aesthetics. I'm, 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 I'm googling, and I think most of the 80s F1 cars, they just it was a, a plank probably that just complemented the rest of the aerodynamics so you might have a it was very very simple and very small certainly not the gillette razors that we've got now let's uh, dig into our mailbag again okay where did we go christopher young christopher at chris on racing you don't like Christopher. No, you full named me last weekend. Oh, when so, we well, were no. Together. If I do Chris Ooh. Stevens, that's fine. If I say young Christopher, I feel that is that's me showing you know some some strong uncle energy. I don't think I'm like Christopher Abraham Stevens. I'm not doing that, am I? No, you still don't like no, it. Don't like All it. right, okay. Don't well, like it. Instead of this, shall we find what mailbag questions you found interesting? Yes, yes, mm. I've dug around the, the mailbag, and it is quite a big bag, yep. um, if I may say so as yep. well. Uh, and I've, I've rummaged around in there, and I found a question from Matt from Canadia land. Oh, Canada, hello. And he says, does Formula One capitalise the least on talent? Oh, big one. In football, it's probably around 85 to 90%. But how many Hamilton and Schumachers have mm. been completely missed due to the nature of motorsport? To which, of course, he refers to the fact that it is a rich man's or rich person's sport. Yeah, and I think he goes on to make a comment on the Canadian drivers as well. Yes. So, that yeah, there's no mm. way Stroll or Latifi mm. are the best drivers in Canada, he says. Um, I would probably... I mean, I don't really know of any... Canadian drivers are even in F2 or F3 um, at the moment, off the top of my head. Matt? Yeah, well, I think we've had this discussion before in various guises, and the math always works out. Motorsport is one of the most expensive sports to get started in as a small child. And there is an inverse relationship between the amount of talent that gets to the top and your starting costs. So something like basketball, something like football or football, depending on <laughs> which country you're in, yeah, can be engaged in um, by a large, very large percentage of the population because the initial costs are quite small. You can develop your talent and skill without spending a lot on equipment. Motorsports, you got to get into carts at an early age, and you have to have the funding all along to run enough in whatever equipment you're racing 
to gain the competitive skills to move up to the next level. And uh, that's always going to leave most of your talent yeah. sitting on the sideline doing something cheaper. So I think the question is, you know, is, is Formula One worse at this? Is motorsport worse at this than other sports? Obviously, I, I think the answer is probably obviously yes. Yeah. But let's compare that to some other sports like, say, soccer uh, or football because you use your feet. And, and you go, well, OK, uh, anyone can play, you know, on the street uh, and, and play on the, the cage pitches in the middle of central London and get discovered. That's true. There is a, a bigger percentage of room for players who grow up in that way. But there's still a massive amount of connected young kids who get academy spots at the right place. And then you get the skills and the talent coached into you and handed to you. And I, I've got an experience of... Uh, attempting to get into a sport at a, a a more than more than town level, and you know, I, I had a coach in one area. It was a fluke that co- it was not intended that I would spend time with this coach, but it just happened to work out for one winter, and I learned more in that one winter than I did in any in, in anything else I'd done in the sport. And if someone's got access to that coach from the age of ten, they're obviously going to have a much stronger chance of making it to professional sport so even in in sports like football and cricket and rugby where you think that's a school sport everyone has a chance there is still this same problem where people can leverage an advantage is just less so but there's also middle ground like cycling yeah does everyone have a road bike available to them are, are there any are there any olympic level canoe uh, guys not canoe rowboat what's the rowing one are there any rowing, rowing? Are there any rowing champions from the inner cities? I, I don't know. Like, it's a genuine question. Like, I don't, I don't think so. And then motorsport is kind of at the top end of that. Um, so, so Chris, like, yeah. obviously, I think the answer is obviously yes. Motorsport yes. is particularly bad for it. But there is also skiing or like patank. Mm-hmm. We've got to buy your own balls. Big heavy metal ones. Yeah. They're not cheap. And I don't <laughs> necessarily think we've missed out on a Hamilton or a Schumacher because I think if you have enough talent, there is a way to sort of circumvent the system a little bit. Um, but if I were to take the bottom four drivers in Formula One at the moment, I would say, yes, there are better drivers currently available than those bottom four who should be on the grid. But it's a systemic issue as well, because you look at the Formula Two field, half of them are there for their money. That's how you run mm. a, uh, a a team in a <laughs> in say like a spec championship, for That's example. You need <laughs> yeah, you need this... one for the to you know get score your results. You need one to pay for the seats. Yeah, well, I'm going to politely, and only because we've been on vacation, disagree with you. I think we have missed out on multiple Hamiltons mm-hmm, and Schumachers, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I, I take your point, Spanners. Even at the level of the lowest investment to start the sport, people with money and access to coaching do have an advantage. But the more people who start the sport, yes, the very, very, very most talented, you're more likely to find them because they could start it without having to invest a lot. I would hold up something like golf as a great example, too, of an expensive sport to start. There are lots of programs for juniors. You can get there's more golfers starting. Then there are motorsports people, I would say, but way less than football or over here in the States, something like basketball. Um, I think the, the uh, mo- uh, motorsport, um, and, and to, to add to what Chris was saying, it's a, it's, it's partly a money, a money, money thing. Uh, if you don't have it, you're likely not to get very far. While on the other hand, like you ask. Spanish football or soccer it's a grassroots sport Mm. Um, you know in school you don't have a subject called motor racing or karting it's just like go out here's a ball kick it around or ride your bike or uh, you know play some tennis so the the, the entry level the um, it's it's very low Mm. and a lot of people play it and the outlet of for talented talent people it's a huge in football for 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 example yeah so i think formula one must be i think it's a good question it must be one of the worst if not the worst sport <laughs> there's <laughs> miss no out on a lot of talent there's no pyramid as well in motorsport yeah. on the way to formula one there's Hard. one tier so there's 20 drivers on the f1 grid how many on the f2 grid chris uh 22 22 okay and it's, it's the same kind of going down if you had i don't know if you had lots of feeder 
series going into F1. Could we improve it with that? Could we have, you know, regional single seaters where someone is you know like w series where someone is making money by people watching the series and going right let's see who the best drivers are could we not do that could that not create a pyramid i don't know how that you, how you bankroll that though i don't know honest. i'm not an, i'm an ideas guy <laughs> <laughs> matt well i think uh, and i hesitate to bring it up but i will because we talked about it not too long ago indycar is an excellent example if you if you have five to ten thousand mm. dollars and a great deal of talent you can go get your start on the bottom of the indycar ladder and win your way all the way up to uh, a seat a partially sponsored seat in the full-time series can't do that in f1 but i would still argue that it's really carding that is is mm. where the problem lies i had a discussion with someone years ago who worked at a motion simulation place that did racing and they had been looked into and raced in some top level FIA carts, Central Europe. And the amount of money they quoted me to do a season, a full season of karting yes. would still make your jaw hit the floor. So it's the, the mouth of the funnel is far too narrow to pick up all the talent. And that is a problem I don't know if we can solve because the sport itself is based on rich people, gentlemen, racing along with a couple of people who are actually good. I think even, this has become less and less of a problem, I think, as Formula One's kind of got more uh, wealthy. But even when I, if oh. I cycle back 10 years or so, there were more opportunities for drivers and uh ej has just reminded me as well about formula renault as well which was a whole other you know f2 level championship that sank in about 2017 i think it was um because renault stopped funding it and there was it was just a a whole other grid which which you also know, could get the, there was that before yeah. super license points uh it was so yeah. oh, well now hang on I think it was around just after they introduced super oh, license okay. points. I can't remember how many it was worth. Well, uh, even the super yeah. license points is designed to get people coming through F3 and F2 rather than anything else. Well, exactly. So it's, desi IndyCar... it's designed to make sure that the people who have come through that system and paid the money to go through that specific system are the ones that get the points to go through. So it's... all of them, yeah. all of them is money. Because even if you took a, a champion from... LMP, uh, not LMP1, like the top class in, in the World Endurance Championship, for example, they've still done F3 and F2, most likely. Most of the drivers move sideways in mm. into that, or from Formula E, or from IndyCar as well, whether they've come up through America or they've come up through Europe, they've still paid money to, to get there. Jules? Yeah, I'm, I'm, last year, we tried to get someone from FIA on this show. I don't know if you guys remember. And when we thought we had a deal, it didn't work out. But one of the things that she was assigned with as an FIA official was to streamline uh, a sort of ladder from the, 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 the junior classes up to F3, F2, F1 with uh, the, uh, the, the goal to have the best drivers in Formula One, which, which really seemed like a statement against paid drivers or mm. paid drivers. Um, so I think, I think maybe, maybe the FIA should, should, um, you know, feel a bit responsible for, for, for this. I mean, imagine whatever sport you watch and, and, and you have to say like, yeah, but 25% of, of this, of this roster or this squad didn't, don't really belong there, don't really deserve to be there, but they have the money. I mean, that's just evaluating yeah. the quality of your, of your product, of your sport, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's 20 drivers on the grid. And it's way too high a proportion. If you want to give me 35 teams, no, not 35 teams, 36 cars and only 28 of them qualify on any given weekend, if you've got that kind of series, yeah, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you've got a, um, I, I don't want to name, start naming drivers. I can't, I've, I can't think of a single paid driver from the 80s. It's just escaped me. Someone help me. Name, uh, na Deniz. Whew, thank you. Whew, I've saved. Yeah. Then there's room for a, a shopping cart full of Pedro Denizes. That's a reference to his family owning supermarkets. 
but you all you all got that you all knew that with 20 cars on the grid and a franchise it does feel like this is something that the f1 is going to want to shake out because all the all the new fans that have flooded in at some point are going to figure out how nepoti- nepotistic and how elite the selection is for this new sport they've fallen in love with at the moment you know people have arrived in formula one and you know they see you know latifi and schumacher and 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 stroll and just accept them but i think in time if they if there's a flood of new drivers keep coming in that are just there for paychecks people are going to get increasingly upset um okay right i think that that is us for the missed apex mailbag episode i called it the muggy mailbag because <laughs> it's threatening to rain but it's not so instead we've just got a sauna here in the uk the moisture has sort of it, the rain has sort of doesn't quite reach the ground and then it starts evaporating so we're all sitting here boiling uh, we can do the traditional matt trumpets showing of the gray shirt if you'd wish and uh, i can tell you that he is at matt pt 55 on twitter in fact he doesn't even have to stand up because uh, you can see how soaked he is there and we have chris on racing at chris on racing doing some kind of interesting tweet or something on his telephone you youngs yeah. you're probably on your tiktoks or something i couldn't resist uh, an instagram opportunity Oh, uh, well, Matt Sweaty Top. Uh, go and follow uh, Chris at Chris on Racing and go and check out the higher competency of the at Mist Apex F1 account on Twitter. I, I We could just pretend that I'm doing a lot better at social media, Chris. Uh, I mean, I'll take full credit. Okay, good. You take full credit. <laughs> and you can also follow Jules at Jules Sagers. Oh, he's on mute. But we will have links yep. to everybody's uh, social media on there. So you can go and give them a follow. Go and do it. Go and give them a follow. They are all worth it. But you should follow me at Spanners Ready because I'm the best one. This has been this has been nice. I haven't done a, a live stream for a while because we've been putting out so much pre-recorded content over the summer break. But I am refreshed. I am energized. I am ready for a triple header. I cannot wait to see if the status quo has been maintained or whether some teams start bouncing up and down. Has the whole flexi floor uh, squashable thing, the squashable floor stay, has that all been exaggerated? Uh, or are we going to see a big shift? And if we do see a big shift, is it too late for anyone else but Red Bull to challenge? We'll find all that out on Sunday. So join us for our race review at 8 p.m. Uh, we'll be ready live at 8 p.m. to talk about the race, or we'll be ready for your Monday morning commute in podcast and YouTube form. I believe we'll be joined by Matt Trumpets, Antonio Rankin, and edgy Kyle Power. Until I see you next, work hard, be kind, and have fun. This was Mr. Apex Podcast. I think we're out of here, aren't we, Matt? Because I said no comment of the week. You did, but I have one if you want to. <laughs> Go for it then. Why don't, why don't you give us a... Comment of the week. Please, please tell me it's the Matrix one. No, it is Dang not. It. I, I was not prepared to do this, but then Jason G made this following comment, and I thought if I was going to award it, it would have to go to this one. Italian tire modeling. Shouldn't they put them on the car rather than wear them? Typical Italians all about the fashion. Oh, dear. Well, who's that? Who's that? It's a new winner, isn't it? Jason G. Congratulations. Brand new winner, Jason G. You're the winner of Comment of the Week. Comment of the Week.